Here I'm just uh, today to talk about the work we've been doing on systemic down in mildew, which if you're a poppy grower, if you've been involved in the poppy industry in the last few years, you'll be well aware that it's, uh, it's been a nasty issue for the disease issue that's reared its head recently and has taken us away from, in some regards, the beautiful, even flowering crops that we, we like to see going into December before we harvest. Um, so I won't go into the industry itself, but I'll just talk about what is downy mildew. Um, and downy mildew is a broad group of diseases. They're not just related to poppies. You, you will see them in onions if you, you're an onion grower, or peas, or brassicas, or what, uh, grapes, or pick your crop by the most part. There's usually a downy mildew associated with them. But it's a downy mildew that's specific to that crop. There's not cross-pollination between them, so there are differences between how these diseases behave within individual crops that we need to be aware of. Um, for poppies, we're quite unusual, and lucky is probably not the right term, but we have a scenario where we actually have two different forms of the disease. So we've, in Tasmania, we've had um, what we now refer to as localised downy mildew for 20 years plus. It's, it's something we've known about, something we've dealt with as an industry we've been able to manage through um, uh, various measures. In recent years, in the last three or four years, we've actually seen this second form of the disease, which we're calling systemic downy mildew. Um, and this is the unusual factor for poppies, where we've got these two forms. And we now know, based on recent work that's um, come out, that there's actually two different fungal species causing those two different diseases. Um, <coughs> If you want to know the names, they're there, they're tongue twisters, so I won't um, bother with it rather than say we have a, a localised downy mildew species and we have a systemic downy mildew species. And what we now know is they're actually both in Tasmania um, that have come in in recent years. I should point out that they're very hard to tell apart visually, the, the actual fungi is actually taken of the order of, well, the first reports of downy mildew and poppy were in Yugoslavia back in about 1929, so it's taken 85, 86, 87 years to work out. There's actually two species in there, so it's, it, it wasn't an easy exercise to do that. So when I'm talking about localised downy mildew, I'm talking about spots on leaves that you know you might get a lot of spots that are gradually growing together. That leaf might die, and, and the understory of your, your crop. Will, will grow, basically die out over time. You'll lose growth, uh, lose green leaf area, which will impact obviously on your final yield, but it doesn't affect the whole plant. Systemic downy mildew is um, the reverse story, where actually the whole plant is affected by the disease. So rather than a spore landing on a leaf, spreading only so far, so only in its local region, and being stopped, in systemic downy mildew, those infections are able to carry on throughout the whole plant, causing either twisting and deforming of capsules and flowering heads, if it's a later infection, very early infections will actually kill the whole plant before it gets, is able to get away. So that's sort of the background of the disease. Now, what I want to touch on now is the work we, we're going forward, and we want to look at how is the disease spreading? Because we know how diseases are spreading, that those are the keys in terms of how we stop the disease spreading. If we know what the key mechanisms are, how we do it, we can then target those, OK, if we stop that spread, we stop the disease. So for downy mildews as a group, there's three main mechanisms they use. It's either in the plant seed itself, it's able to survive, or sometimes in soil and stubble in the ground for a period. They are actually also able to produce spores that can be then released onto air currents and spread um, across regions. So what we're doing now is really teasing out for poppy down mildew and specifically systemic down mildew, which of these are, are present and how important they are in terms of spreading the disease overall. So I'll start with the, the um, first question, which is C, which is in some regards the most advantage for advantage ages for a downy mildew because it can spread with its host. It it, it, it can carry it along, so it doesn't need to look for a new host plant. It's already there when the plant's germinating. So bad news um, that came out of the work we first started doing here was, yes, 
systemic dandy mildew is present in seed. It's fairly common in commercial seed, um, and we, we were able to find that out through a combination of doing microscopy, uh, which we've got a cross section there showing the uh, ooze spore, which is the spore that is formed inside the seed coat of a poppy seed. Um, and that was then, the species was confirmed using DNA testing techniques. The good news is, even though it's in seed, it's not there at high rates. It's typically when in the investigation we did, it was only about 5% of seed actually had it. The even better news is the transmission rate from that seed into fresh seedlings when you actually sow the seed is very low, less than 1% typically. Um, and it was actually a source of frustration for us as a research group when we first started because we were, we were setting up experiments and we were seeing nothing. And I thought, well, that doesn't make sense. We expect to see some level of disease. And it wasn't until we started going at you know, big greenhouse trials, 10,000 plus plants or more, that we're actually reliably able to pick up the transmission from seed to seed. So it's, it's very inefficient in that regard. Um, the next bit of good news is we've been looking at um, treatment of seed ways of knocking down that transmission rate even further. Um, so and this is just a very simple graph here to show three um, treatments we're looking at. So on the, on the left there is just the, the untreated seed. So if we sowed untreated seed, about eight out of a thousand seedlings would germinate and have systemic downy mildew within a couple of weeks of germinating. If we use a bleach or an or a alternative treatment, we can knock that down by another 90%. So we're taking it down to less than one in a thousand plants quite quickly. So that's quite good news in that regard. And I should point out that some of these treatments are what the poppy industry guys have now taken on board and they do as part of their standard commercial practice before the seeds are missed to growers. So the next option in terms of spread is soil. Um, and really when we're talking about soil, we're talking about crop residues. Because those spores, those ooze spores I showed, the in seed, they all they form throughout most of the poppy plant. Um, we can readily see them in leaves. You harvest a crop, but you're really only interested in taking the capsule away, because that's what you pay for as a grower. The rest of the crop is usually left on the ground, except mulched in, reincorporated, or I know some people would burn, but for the most part, it's, it's been left in the ground. That's a source of inoculum going forward into subsequent years. And from the work we've done, that's actually a much more virulent source of inoculum than seeds. Uh, in initial testing in greenhouses, um, we we're able to show that you, you take uh, soil from a previous poppy crop, 10% of those seedlings will have systemic down mildew if you sow into it within about four or five weeks. So you get as opposed to seed scenario where you're talking half percent, point eight percent, something like that, ten percent. So it's a big difference in terms of relative effect. Um, the other um, complicating factor there is volunteer poppies. So when harvested, there's a lot of poppy seed that actually is left over, gets left in the ground. Those will grow up, even if that seed doesn't have damp systemic down mildew in it. It's growing in ground that has systemic downy mildew. So those plants that come up, there'll be systemic downy mildew. Um, and if they're not, once they, those plants are off, they're suppressing oculum, spreading the survival and so So it's, it's basically like having another crop. If you don't get on top of you, you regrow quickly. Um, just to, to demonstrate the effect there, so on the bottom left, we actually have healthy plants that have gone into healthy soil. But then we've got a close up, and then we've got a plant there that's obviously struggling along, trying to survive. And this is quite a dramatic example. We've got healthy plants down the bottom that have been sown into healthy soil. This is soil that's come from a, a, a recent poppy field. You can see the, uh, the difference in germination and survival, the survivability of those plants in that environment. And this is um, some quite recent data, so it's um, hot off the presses, I might be one way to look at it, I guess. So this is results from surveys we've done this year in conjunction with poppy companies. So we've been going around paddocks of various ages, that might have been in poppies last year, might have been poppies two years ago, three years ago, four years ago. We've been collecting soil from that, and we're in the process now of uh, 
um, looking at what the transmission from that soil is, but also trying to measure what the inoculum load in that soil is and trying to match those up. This is very early data, but I think it shows an interesting scenario where soil that was poppies last summer, we take back, you know, 30% plants in that case on average. So poppies after poppies is, is a no-go, just based on that data alone. Even a year after, it's about the same number. There is a drop, up, drop off after two to three years, um, but we've still seen some evidence even after five years that there, there's still some transmission and that's all. It's interim data, so I don't want to put too much on it. I just want to highlight the issue around making sure you have a good three, four, five year rotation rather than having a very short two year rotation for those poppies. I should point out that five year is only based on two field sites at the moment, that's all we had available. So don't go away thinking five years is not enough. We could have just picked two bad sites and been unlucky. There's more data coming from this. We'll be continuing this over the coming years. So the last option is airborne transmission. Um, as I said, Dan Milchies can produce spores uh, on leaves. There's a close-up of what the spore structure actually looks like. I always tend to think it looks a little bit like a lollipop tree or something of that nature. Both spores get released and they can spread on air currents quite a considerable distance in some systems. Um, so this year we actually set up a, a series of spore traps around the state and we're looking at monitoring the spread of spores and the temporal spread. So what time are they available in the cropping life? Where around the state are they at a given time? So we can get an idea of when they're about, when fungicide sprays should be going on to counter that because these are susceptible to fungicide sprays. Just like localised animal mildew uh, is susceptible to fungicide sprays. The systemic animal mildew is no different in this regard. And I think I've caught up a bit of time for it. So just to finish off, where are we going from here? So this is what I've talked about now as part of a four year project that's just started this year. Um, this is followed on from a two year project that was an initial response to um, the outbreak of systemic damage which was set up by the, the state government um, in conjunction with poppy companies and TIA. So that was a very good first step in trying to get some very good background information. We're now going forward and looking at what are the longer term implications, what are the longer term issues. And I tend to take back to what are the, the key unanswered questions. First one there, how important actually is seed transmission? It's very low. Um, so is it, is it that important or is it a side issue? That's what we're trying to tease out at the moment. Sort of touched on already, what is the length of good rotation? You know, looks like three years might not be enough. We, we might need to spread things out further. But I'm coupled with that, are there ways that we can then bring that back through good control of volunteers, getting rid of the residues more rapidly, these sort of questions underlie that. How far can spores spread, how quickly, what time of year, that sort of question. We're also interested in the, the, the question of there's two species and they behave differently. Why? Because if we can work out what makes the localised animal do the localised as, and the, the less severe form, Maybe we can work out what about the systemic cause would go the other way and potentially switch that off, either through a control or some form of host resistance or something of that nature. So it's an interesting question to us that might have long-term implications. It's certainly not going to be fixed for next year, but it's potentially it's a long-term solution. And we're also interested in why are some crops more badly affected than others. I mean, everyone's probably seen a really bad crop right next to a really healthy crop and, and scratch their heads and wondered why. We have some hints and we have some clues, um, but we want to solidify that data a bit more so we can really know why those differences are. And ultimately, we want to be able to tell the industry, where's the bank for buck? Are we, do we really need to put a lot of emphasis in controlling seed? Um, it, but that's potentially a lot of money where we'd be better focused on making sure rotations are maintained um, and getting a greater effect, a, a, a greater benefit from doing that. Where's the value in terms of where we put our resources? Because the, un, I mean, the unfortunate part of this is the only way to guarantee you 
won't get systemic down and you'll do as a poppy grower in the state now is don't grow poppies. But it can be managed and that's what I want to take on. And I'll just leave it for that. So this is, I should highlight the people that have been involved in this work and most importantly the people that have been involved in funding this work. So we work in and with the, the, the companies, we actually go out and build sites. Um, we, we talk to them, talk to field officers, get information about their observations, how that matches with what we see. State government's been very involved, and, and I believe Jeremy's gone, but he's, he's always been a very good supporter of this work. Uh, Poppy Growers Tasmania, Keith is here, thank you very much. Um, the current work is funded by a federal government grant, and I should acknowledge that TPI enterprises were involved in the initial stages of this work as well.